Hey guys, so this is my vintage uh, German made Pfaff 130. It was made in um, approximately 1951, 1952. Uh, so it's 60 plus years old, but it's in mint, mint condition. Um, I've restored a lot of these machines in the past and I always end up keeping the best condition ones for myself and then gifting or donating or selling the other ones. Um, I actually have two of these machines. Um, this one was my personal machine and then my wife also uses one which is over there. Um, and they are, they're phenomenal. I've used Neckies, Adlers, Singers, um, the Foffs, uh, all different types of machines and, and these are the ones that I use. Um, just the, the, to me they're just the best. Uh, this one has been totally, totally restored. So the motor and the light have both been rewired with brand new wire. Uh, the motor has been um, serviced so the commutator was polished, uh, the mica was undercut, the brushes were replaced, um, everything has been totally serviced on the motor. So the motor is functioning as if it was new. Uh, and the wiring on it, including the power plug, the foot control cable, everything is all brand new. Uh, new bobbin winder tire. Um, and those are about the only wearable parts on this machine. Everything else is, is steel. The, um, the belt is original actually, and I prefer the original belts just because I like the way that they look. Um, and as long as they're functioning, then I'll run them when I can. So the original belt's still on there, but I do have plenty of replacements. Um, so here's one of them. I just don't particularly like the look of this on this vintage machine. I feel like it's kind of an eyesore. Uh, but but I'll, I'll, I'll include it. So, so yeah, I am going to be selling this one. I mean, the only reason why I am selling it is because I'm, I've, I've upgraded basically to a FOF 138. Um, and that's become my, um, basically my daily use machine over the uh, FOF 130. And we still have one, which my wife uses. So I don't see the sense in, in keeping two machines when the FOF 138 is essentially just the industrial version of this one. So, so yeah, so I'm going to be selling it. Um, and it's it's basically this thing's in mint condition. Uh, no bed wear. Uh, there's no chipping, cracking, crazy. None of the stuff that happens on some of the, on these vintage machines. You can see the bed reflection. Um, how good a condition that is. All the decals are really good. All the uh, chrome on it, or all the polished parts. Let me there it goes. It focuses. So you can see it's all in really good shape. Uh, these machines basically have never moved. They sat in this table. And um, when they're not being used, they're covered with a cotton cover. And so they're not banging around in like a case or, or being folded in and out of a folding table. So um, I got them in really good condition and they've stayed in really good condition. Uh, mechanically, it's perfect. Uh, the FOF 130s tend to seize up around these stitch width dials. Uh, it's a pretty common problem. And the tolerances are really tight on these things. So... Uh, any kind of buildup of uh, you know uh, oil, old oil, which basically turns into a varnish, um, will make these machines run pretty tight, and it's a pretty common thing. So I've totally ripped this machine apart, soaked everything in kerosene, given it a really good scrub down. So it's really really smooth, and everything's really smooth on this machine, um, and it's in it's in excellent shape. So I figured I'd do a sewing demonstration on it just so you can see what the machine's capable of. Uh, and then hopefully it's a good, it'll find a good home and, and, uh, and get used regularly. It's a thing, I hate to see these types of machines that are, <coughs> excuse me, so superior to the modern stuff, just kind of get left by the wayside because people dismiss them as, as being old, you know, just be based on the age. But in actuality, these are really the pinnacle of, 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 I would say, sewing machine manufacturing, engineering, and, and, um, design everything. You're not going to find a better machine uh, made today. I mean they just the the quality of the materials, the tolerances, the attention to detail, the engineering, they made no compromises at that time. They were they were building lifelong machines and, and this is a testament to it. This thing's 60 years old um, and and functioning phenomenally. So let me do a I'll do a sewing demonstration just so you can see how it operates. 
And then I'll kind of go over some of the things to look for. Uh, if you don't end up getting, you know, if you, if you don't end up buying mine, I'm going to leave the video up online anyway. So people who may be looking at um, a FOF for themselves, local in the area, will kind of know what to look for. But I'll save that for the end. Um, and then right now, I'm just going to wind a bobbin so you can see the process and what's involved there. And then we'll, we'll sew some, some pieces. I have some uh, vinyl, like upholstery vinyl, and some denim. Um, samples just so so you can take a look and see how that works so my the machine is fast you can see and it's really smooth but these things really move compared to something like a, a Singer 201 or a Singer 1591 or any of the, the majority of vintage machines you'll see out there um, this is much faster but the really appealing thing too is that the speed is controllable a lot more controllable. I had an Adler um, 189 that is really really nice but the speed control just wasn't there. Just the way that they had the balance, hand wheel balance it just it just didn't feel right. So here we go let's wind the bobbin. So you run the bobbin through you, keep, you never have to take it off that top spool. You just leave it on the top spool there. Um, put it through the tension discs and you drop it onto the bobbin winder. This is an automatic bobbin winder, so you push this button down here and it'll engage it on the wheel and then you can wind the bobbin. So, and then I, I, I just hold it at a certain angle and it'll trim off that edge for me, but typically you would just stop there, but let the machine go. And it automatically disengages when it's when the bobbin's full, and you can see how fast that that really was able to fill that up. Uh, let me grab some scissors. So it's really a fast machine, um, and it uses a bobbin case. It's a full rotary hook machine, so you load the bobbin in uh, to the bobbin case, so it rotates clockwise in the bobbin case. You pull it through the little channel here and right through the top. This particular thread, I'm using white so you can see it on the material that I'm going to be sewing. It's um, a Guterman uh, Mara 70, which is a Tex 40 thread. So let's go ahead and wind it, or uh, thread the machine. It's pretty straightforward. You're going to bring it through the guide here, underneath the tension discs, underneath this little, through the check spring, through this guide. Raise the uh, take-up lever arm all the way to the top, run it through, through the guides. Let's turn this light on so, so the light works. You can see it. I'm going to turn it off in a second just so it doesn't um, blow out the image on the video. So, uh, And then you trap the thread, rotate the hand wheel, and you, the thread will come up. So the needle in here is an Oregon um, 16 slash 100. Had pretty good experiences with these needles, and on a thread like this, this thick, the Tex 40, it's it's a pretty good option. So here's some denim. That's pretty heavyweight stuff. Um, let's do four layers so you can see how it runs, and then I'll show you. It'll it'll sew through eight layers. So so let's do straight stitch first. So let's do five millimeter stitch length. So you can see how smooth that thing goes. And the stitches are well balanced. Um, and so you have slow speed control on this thing. And so you can go really slow. You can do a stitch at a time. This is one of the benefits of these, uh, of these um, domestic machines is these onboard motors are really easy to control. They don't quite have um, some of the penetrating power that you would get on an industrial motor, but for most purposes, you're, you're not going to need it. So you can see, I think that's the longest stitch, five millimeters. And it's really balanced through four layers and it goes through it no problem. Let's shorten it <clears throat> to say uh, two millimeters and we'll do a wider stitch. Um, so you can see the zigzag.
Oh, you know what? I just realized the thread broke as I'm going. I'm like, what, what happened? If you look what happened here, I'm using one of these unconventional spools. And the, the thread got twisted here, and it's stuck. So when you're using a normal thread spool, um, you'll, you won't have that problem. Um, I forgot, normally I run it on this one. If I'm going to be using these spools, I just forgot to switch it over. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what happened. That's why that thread broke. So we'll put it on that one, <clears throat> and we'll re-thread the machine, and you'll see how quickly it can be done. So that's what happened. I'm not gonna re I'm not gonna redo the video just because you know something like that, but it happens. It's, I'd rather show you and, and let you know why in case I ha in case you run into a similar problem. But yep, so you just rethread it, and you can see where the tension started to get really high on here, where it looks like a straight line, and the bottom thread's being pulled up. So that's what happened. But. Uh, Let's go back and start again. And you can see now the stitches look normal again. Let me zoom in so you can really see what's, what's going on there. So, and you can do really, really, really tight satin stitches on this. You can go even tighter. Now you just gotta be mindful of feeding when you're feeding this stuff through is that a satin stitch, when you're stitching this, you're building up a mound of thread basically. So you're creating like this arch above the fabric. So <clears throat> you gotta be conscious about the feeding because there's very little feed dog movement on this to get the stitch that close. So you gotta give it a little bit of a push as you go. Unless you go and you get a, a satin foot which is basically it has a it basically has a hollowed out portion right behind the needle that uh, basically a tunnel that allows the the fabric or the uh, mound of thread to go through but you can see it does a really tight stitch we'll lengthen the stitch um, and it does really large zigzag too so this is actually a favorite for um, boaters because they can take this and use it on their boats to re repair canvas their canvas sails and whatnot, so you can see there if the machine focus oh the light. Sorry. There you go. You can see the really big stitch. So it's good for canvas work. Um, let me go to the end and uh, we'll do eight layers so you can see how that looks. Um, and you can see really great balance stitches through four layers of, of heavyweight denim. And it'll sew through eight layers, and then I'll go through and I'll pull out the, uh... And you can see, eight layers is a lot. I mean, um, this is a lot of material. I, it'll sew through this, no problem. But you are putting the machine through, through a little bit of abuse, so... Um, I don't know, I, I try to err on the side of caution, and, and <clears throat> that's kind of why I went up to an industrial machine. I'm less worried about it, but you can see eight layers of material you're talking <clears throat> over a quarter inch you're talking basically three-eighths of material and that's really thick especially on tight weed uh, denim like this so it'll fit underneath the presser foot and that really is going to be most mainly your limiting factor is your presser foot but you'll see this will sew no problem and in, in oh, i'm stuck here on this yeah that thread got stuck underneath the presser foot. <clears throat> All kinds of technical problems here. But anyway, so the machine itself functions. So you can see how well it feeds uh, through eight layers. And it'll go, I'm not even touching it. And that stitch you can see coming across here is, it looks exactly the same as the stitch we had done just through four layers. So the feeding on it's really good. Let's uh, do a straight stitch. Shorten that stitch length down to a three millimeter. And you can see. There, that was a slight zigzag. I didn't turn the lever all the way. But um, yeah, no problem going through eight layers of uh, denim, three eighths of inch material, no problem. 
And I'll show you the bottom of the machine too, the underside. This is super robust. These things, they, uh, they're, they really overbuilt them. So this is something you would use like um, a marine grade vinyl. So if you're doing like uh, upholstery on like uh, cushions for like a boat or something, or you know, whatever, any kind of upholstery material. Um, let's do four layers of it, which is pretty much the most you would encounter. Typically on this kind of stuff, you'd be doing two layers at a time, maybe three depending on the type of seam, but we'll do four just so you can see how capable it is and how well it it feeds. So let's do a zigzag. We'll do this. So. And it feeds it. You can see I'm not touching it. It feeds the material through, no problem. You get a really consistent stitch there. Top and bottom look really good. You could probably bump the tension up a little bit. It looks like a little bit could have been pulled up right there, but everything else looks good. But, uh, but yeah, so, and then let's do a really longest stitch, longest and widest. So. You can see how fast the machine goes when you want it to. So it'll sew through all this stuff, really precise. Um, it has a needle position so you can adjust the position of the needle left, right, or center, which is a pretty big deal. You can see, the thing just flies through. It's, these machines really are phenomenal. So um, there you go, top, bottom, that's four layers. It'll do eight layers of this stuff. I'm not gonna do it because it's really pressing it. Um, on this machine, but and you can look at the bottom now. It's a rotary hook. So it's it's let me zoom out So the um, It's a cleated nylon belt now you need to be careful on these belts and you need to check them out when you're gonna go to buy a Fof that has this a belt Where if these get soaked with oil they'll turn dark black and the oil actually will degrade the nylon and over a course of you know 50 60 years of this machine machine sitting around these, it'll weaken the nylon fibers and you'll have these belts breaking and they're expensive to replace and they're expensive and you can't, I mean, the, there's only one guy that I know that's making replacement belts and he's selling them for $150 um, on eBay. Now, if mine broke, I, I would replace it in a heartbeat because to me, this machine's worth triple that. So, um, but just be aware of that. Take a look. You don't want to saturate it with oil. Um, if you take like a... a piece of paper towel or something and you press it on here and see if you absorb off any oils, it's, it's not a good sign. Um, but you can see everything here, it's, it's pretty robust steel. So it goes from a belt drive to a geared mechanism here and the gear and then the hook is forward facing, easy to load the bobbin in and out and you can also do a twin needle and so you'll get a parallel twin needle stitch. And th those look really cool great for like decorative work or utility seams or whatever um, and yeah so I mean that's that's basically it for the machine um, I like them a lot they get really good reviews this one is in perfect condition um, and yeah so email me if you have any questions and uh, and uh, there you go it's the uh, 1951 FOF 130